Okay. Can folks hear us there now? We go. Thanks. Great. Um, excellent. So in terms of what's changing right now, um, we know that anxiety and depression are also in flux. This is an issue that um, many children are already dealing with, and it's either getting um, it's it's heightening or that it um, the challenges are in flux. And in, in many cases, many um, many children are also dealing with new challenges that they haven't faced before. So the focus of this right now is really on anticipating future needs and making sure. Um, that students have what they need um, moving forward. So I'll pass it off to Alex now. So a lot of Sandy Hook Promises work really focuses on, on a youth audience. Um, and a lot of what we're going to talk about today is, uh, you know, obviously suicide is an issue that faces people regardless of age, income, gender, et cetera. Um, but I think for our young people, this is a, an increasingly problematic issue. Uh, so I am actually going to start my segment with a little pop quiz. Uh, so you should see a poll come up on your screen right about now, which is uh, suicide is what leading cause of death for young people age 15 to 24. It looks like folks are filling that out. Great. I'll give you all just a couple seconds here. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll in three, two, and one. All right, poll is closed. I'm gonna go ahead and show you all the results here. Uh, so it looks like folks, 51% uh, of folks said that it's the uh, uh, foremost leading cause of death, uh, followed by the second leading cause of death here. Um, so I am, uh, it's, those who said the second leading cause of death are correct. Uh, so suicide is in fact the second leading cause of death for young people age 15 to 24 years old. And uh, I think a more alarming statistic here is according to the CDC, it actually causes more death than the next nine leading causes of death combined. Um, and for those who are wondering what the first leading cause of death is for young people, it's uh, accidents of some kind. Um, but I always find that statistic particularly alarming, um, though I also like to think of it as a challenge in a way. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is solutions to this issue. So I, wanna, I want us to see that statistic as, as a challenge. What can we as adults do to help decrease that number for our young people? Um, and unfortunately, I think, you know, though I, I've issued this challenge to help decrease the rates of suicide among youth, what we actually see is that it's increasing um, right now. So since 2007, the number of hospital visits for suicide attempts or suicidal thoughts has nearly doubled from uh, 580,000 to 1.12 million among children ages 5 to 18. And unfortunately, 40% uh, of those visits are students age 5 through 12. So as we talk about some of these warning signs and things that we might see in a student or a young person that indicate that they're thinking about suicide. Um, one thing I want to caution against is uh, is a mindset that oh that that child is too young to be thinking about taking their own life because um, as we can see from this information, um, that's absolutely not the case. So for more information on the prevalence of suicide, I'm going to turn it over to Stan. Hi, right, thank you, Alex. So we're all aware of the number of suicide deaths among youth and, and how troubling those numbers are and realize that each one of those numbers re, you know, represents a family, a life, uh, a community that was impacted. But really, it's, it, we need to take a step back and look at the larger issue because that's only a part of the picture. When, uh, based on data from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is a national survey given anonymously, anonymously to youth, about 17% of youth reported that they had seriously considered suicide. And you see the breakdown, it's actually higher. Uh, we see higher reporting among females uh, than males. 
more than that, about 7.4% of students reported that they'd actually made a suicide attempt. So yes, the, the numbers are, are troubling about the number of suicides that we have, but it's an even bigger problem than that. And I mentioned that I've been doing this work for about 20 years and the good news and the bad news. The, the good news is that those numbers have been pretty consistent over the last 20 years. That although the numbers of suicide deaths have, have slightly risen, the num uh, numbers of students or percentages of students reporting that they've had thoughts of suicide or made a suicide plan or made an attempt has stayed consistent. The bad news is, is that the numbers have stayed consistent, that we, even with all the work we're doing in youth suicide prevention, we haven't been able to turn the curve. And really, uh, that's where our focus needs to be. It's not just about the number of youth who, who die by suicide. It's about a, the number of youth who are in so much emotional pain that they're having thoughts of suicide. And that's another part of what we want to address today, which is upstream prevention and how do we, we get to them sooner. So now that we've kind of established, uh, I guess, the, the, the problem framework for youth suicide, and we've looked at the statistics and figures of, uh, you know, suicidal thoughts and uh, suicide attempts facing youth in our country, we want to take a quick moment before we move into kind of some of the solutions piece to remind you that prevention is critical because recovery is possible. Um, and, you know, that's one of the big things that we we try to talk about with our messaging to you is that just because you know you or a friend might be feeling suicidal right now or might be having a crisis right now doesn't mean that you're going to feel that way forever uh, which is why it again is so important that we focus on on prevention work um, according to the harvard school of public health 70 percent of people who are hospitalized for a suicide attempt never attempt again and we see that 90% of those uh, who survive a suicide attempt go on to not die by suicide. So we can see here that, you know, even though someone may have attempted suicide in their past, again, recovery is possible there, you know, and that is why prevention is so important is because we can help people get to that point of recovery. So part of how we get to that point is by knowing what to be on the lookout for. Uh, one of the programs that Sandy Hook Promise has, which I'll talk about in a little bit, is Say Something, and we teach students to look for warning signs and threats. Uh, so I'm gonna give us all a, a brief explainer on just some of those warning signs that we're gonna be on the lookout for. Um, just a, a reminder that this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, I can't, you know, give you every warning sign in just a couple of minutes. I would also note that suicidal ideation, suicidal thoughts, warning signs of suicide look different in every single person. Um, so there's no type of, of student or type of behavior that says, okay, this is definitely a warning sign of suicide. It can look different for everybody. And as we talked about, you know, there's, there's no such thing as a student who's too young um, to be showing these signs. So we really just need to be paying attention to, to all students so, and young people. So if we see these warning signs, we know to take them seriously. Um, we do see that 80% of teens who uh, attempt to take their own life do give some kind of warning sign. And I'm not saying that this is always going to be a blatant or obvious warning sign. Sometimes they may be very subtle. As I mentioned, it looks different for everybody. But some general things to keep in mind, uh, giving away possessions is always a big one that we're, we're on the lookout for. And what we mean here is, you know, if this is something that a young person holds near and dear to their heart uh, and they're, they're giving it away because they, they say something that they may not need it anymore, something along those lines, that's absolutely a warning sign. Expressing any sort of ideation about taking one's own life. Uh, and this is a tough one. I, people make jokes about this kind of thing all the time, not necessarily thinking about it. Um, unfortunately, we live in a society where, oh, that math test was so hard, I could kill myself. Like that is part of our vernacular, unfortunately, but it's important that we always take those references seriously and follow up. In addition, self-harm can be a warning sign of suicide. Uh, self-harm is a tough one because it also exists. Uh, Non-suicidal ideation is its own category. Um, but we do see that students who um, have self-harmed in the past 
have already demonstrated an ability to inflict bodily harm on themselves. So that can contribute to being a risk factor for suicide or a warning sign for suicide. Uh, if a student is generally, uh, you know, worried, on edge, or unusually angry, and again, this is the focal point here is that this is kind of the extreme end of that spectrum. And then lastly, uh, or second to lastly, a gathering means of attempting, and this can be anything, uh, you know, accruing substances, getting a hold of a firearm, things of that nature. And then the one last thing I want to touch on is is withdrawing, um, which I think is is one that's tough to think about, particularly in terms of quarantining, um, because we're all a little withdrawn from, I think, what we would identify as a, a normal day-to-day -day existence or social interaction. Um, but here, just paying attention to, you know, is a young person not engaging with anyone? They're really, really isolating in their room. They're not coming out. They're not interacting with uh, family or those who they're quarantining with. Uh, and, you know, are they not doing the things that they normally do with their peers uh, on a virtual basis? You know, they're not engaging, you know, they're not playing Minecraft with their friends or uh, something along those lines. So, again, paying close attention to not only what do these warning signs look like uh, from person to person, but also what do they look like now? So, as I mentioned, withdrawal probably gives us, it is in a bit of a different place now than it was uh, prior to COVID. The last place that I want to talk about warning signs is social media. Um, I think it's, it's tough to talk about young people in this day and age without talking about social media, particularly during the times of COVID. I think folks are way more uh, engaged on social media platforms um, because that, that is our social outlet right now. Um, so Pew Research Center reports that 45% uh, of teens report being online near constantly, um, which I, I think is simultaneously surprising and not surprising, um, but it goes to show that we do have to take what the students see on social media very seriously. Um, and we want to encourage them to bring that to our attention. So if they see a post that they're worried about, we want to increase that normalcy of talking about what they're seeing on social media. Um, so we don't want to kind of pester the like, what are you looking at now? What are you looking at now? What are you looking at now? But we do want to increase that that literacy around what that social media platform looks like. Um, so this is my my small shout out to I think it's super important as adults that we maybe not sign up for and engage on every single social media platform, because at this point that might be basically a full time job. Um, but you should at least know what they look like. Um, so, you know, by no means am I telling you to get off this webinar and immediately sign up for TikTok, um, but I am saying that we should know generally what that is. Um, so, for example, one of the things that we come across most in our work is we encourage students to, you know, act immediately, take it seriously, and say something to a trusted adult, and we ask them to bring screenshots with them if they see a social media post that they're worried about. And a student will immediately tell you, if I take a screenshot of a Snapchat, it tells the person that I took a screenshot of their post. Um, so it's important to know those little workarounds because it, it gives you that increased credibility as an adult so you don't seem like you're ancient and don't identify with their technology. So for example, our workaround for that is to encourage the young people to use another phone to take a photo of the Snapchat post that they're worried about um, so that way they don't have to deal with the uh, implications of notifying the other person that they took a, a screenshot. And then the last thing we want to point out here is that the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline actually has a uh, help page specifically for social media. So you can, it tells you how to report concerning posts within that platform, which is super, super helpful. And then the last thing that I'm going to talk about is our program. Uh, so the first thing I'm gonna do is launch a quick poll to uh, ask how many of you, just to get a general feeling based on the webinar audience, how many of you have uh, used Say Something, the Say Something Anonymous reporting system uh, or Save Promise Clubs in your school or community? So I'll give y'all a few seconds to answer those.
All right, give everybody about 10 more seconds. All right, I'm gonna close the poll in three, two, and one. <clears throat> okay, so it looks like uh, the majority of you have not. So that means what I'm about to say is not going to be uh, redundant for a lot of folks, which is phenomenal. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of an intro to some of our Know the Science programs. The one that's not pictured on this slide, um, because Say Something and the anonymous reporting system are a little more relevant for this conversation, is Start With Hello. Uh, Start With Hello is based in social inclusion. Uh, we want students to, to take charge and be leaders on, on making sure that we don't have students who are feeling isolated when they're in their day-to-day -day school routines. Um, and then Say Something, which is essentially the exact same thing as our Say Something anonymous reporting system, has three steps. Uh, I've alluded to most of them up to this point, almost like I planned it that way. Um, and those three steps are to look for warning signs and threats, to act immediately and take it seriously, and to say something to a trusted adult or use our anonymous reporting system. We also have, you'll see, uh, the bottom image here is our Save Promise Club. That stands for Students Against Violence Everywhere. So we really want to put uh, our money where our mouth is on this one and, and talk about how much we encourage youth leadership. Um, because, you know, as we just talked about on the social media slide, sure, we can look at Snapchat and TikTok all day, but it, the messaging really means more when the peers are communicating it to each other than it does coming from adult down. Uh, so Safe Promise Clubs are those opportunities for youth to really be involved in leading our program. Uh, the one thing that sets our, our programming apart a bit is that we do have, uh, with our anonymous reporting system, we have an absolutely stellar crisis center. Our crisis center counselors have been trained and are able to um, get information from anonymous tips, and they're also able to help students who are making tips about themselves. Um, so if a student is unable to access their trusted adult to say something to, they always, you know, have a place to go. Uh, our Crisis Center is the only one of its kind because it works directly with the school. So when, a, when our anonymous reporting system gets a tip, the school also knows about that tip, as does local law enforcement, if it's deemed to need that law enforcement involvement, which I will touch more on on the next slide. So our anonymous reporting system and our crisis center was generous enough to give me a little bit of data for this presentation today. It's also data that they've shown our organization just to demonstrate you know, how much of the front lines they are seeing. So we have here on this table is data on anonymous tips that they were getting prior to the COVID-19 quarantine and then during the COVID-19 uh, quarantine. So what we see is prior to, uh, bullying was our number one tip type with 21% of our tips being related to bullying. And after the quarantine began, we saw an uptick or a kind of a, a movement there and that suicide became uh, our most prevalent tip type. So that all ties in to demonstrate how important it is that um, you know, students are getting the support they need in terms of suicide prevention. Um, I should also mention that Sandy Hook Promise is currently developing a suicide prevention specific module of Say Something that will be coming in the fall of 2020. Um, and then the last thing I want to point out is just the, the in, kind of intensity of the situation that we're living through right now. And again, really that focusing in on the importance of prevention is that down at the bottom, that very last row of our table, you see the delineation between life safety and non-life safety tips. Life safety tips are ones that um, we deem to be the, the tipster or the student who's being reported about is in imminent danger. So as I mentioned, those are the ones that we get law enforcement involved with. Um, so we saw an uptick from pre-COVID, we saw 16% of our tips were life safety and now we're looking closer to 33%. Um, so this is all to say, you know, from an SHP or Sandy Hook Promise perspective, we are really seeing that this is um, you know, the suicide prevention has always been vital, um, but now uh, it's, you know, even more so. Uh, so with that, I will turn it back over to Nalini. Great. Thank you, Alex. Um, so 
as we are being presented with these new challenges, um, these new questions, the new realities, I want to share with you a little bit of what's going on at the legislative level, how leaders, how the government, how agencies are approaching this issue and what room there is to improve with that. So suicide prevention is certainly on the radar for Congress, but there's a lot more to do to support the needs as we're recognizing them now. So a couple of things to know, um, as you may be familiar, Congress has been passing a number of packages um, to provide relief for the coronavirus and its multiple impacts, whether it's um, economic, whether it's on businesses, whether it's on schools. One of the things that they did provide money for is $50 million for suicide prevention at large, including some for the suicide lifeline. Sandy Hook Promise is continuing advocacy on a number of suicide prevention um, bills, including the Stand Up Act. The Stand Up Act is a piece of legislation that San, uh, Sandy Hook Promise introduced just about one year ago, focused on providing resources for students and youth to better access suicide prevention in their schools. This becomes ever more important now because we know that um, as Alex has presented, um, youth and students have an acute need for suicide prevention. And whenever they're able to go back to school, this is going to be something that's uh, gonna be critically important for their health and safety. We are in addition also advocating for $80 million in funding for the suicide lifeline and mental health professionals in schools. We know right now anecdotally that um, many suicide prevention and crisis center lifelines and hotlines are receiving a higher volume of calls, um, both from folks who are, um, who are in need of resources and folks who are in increasingly feeling the pressure of this new situation. So that's why we're, we're continuing to, um, to be leaders in this field and in this practice to make sure that there continues to be solid funding and resources for these programs. We're now gonna transition a little bit more into the solutions of what an individual can do uh, when it comes to preventing suicide, knowing the warning signs and intervening. And for that, I'm gonna pass this off to Stan. Great, thanks so much, Nalini. Can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, so one of the, the big beliefs that I have when it comes to suicide prevention is that we really need to demystify suicide prevention and we need to empower friends and family and understand that um, we as communities and that connectedness is one of the things that keeps individuals here. So we've thrown a lot of information at you, so we're going to slow it down, take a deep breath, and I want to take you through some of the very kind of concrete steps that you can take to uh, ensure that you're, you're doing the best you can for those in your life. So these are very big buckets, and this is a very simplified version, but um, just want to take you through some steps. So number one is we have to be aware. Uh, I'm going to share with you a website here in just a moment where you can learn more about the warning signs. Alex gave you a very quick introduction to those earlier, uh, but I would also encourage you uh, to look and see where you might be able to attend a training. You know, when the when the world resumes, or many trainings are being offered virtually right now, uh, but there are websites. You just we need to be aware, and we need to stay connected to individuals so that we can recognize those warning signs when they do enter into their lives. Number two is we need to not be afraid to ask directly about suicide, or we need to at least address that peer and still talk directly. There's a myth that's been perpetuated that when we talk about suicide, we're going to cause it to happen. And there's been numerous studies that have shown that asking directly about suicide will not put the thought in somebody's head. And in fact, it's the only way to truly identify if someone is having thoughts and what level of risk they might be. So I'm going to give you some, some deeper steps on that in just a moment. A safety plan intervention is something that a lot of people aren't familiar with, but it's been shown as one of the most effective strategies once someone has been identified at risk or having thoughts of suicide to sit down and do a safety plan. And ideally it's done with a mental health professional, but I'm gonna show you some other resources. You do not need to be a mental health professional to sit down with somebody and conduct a safety plan to help that person feel safe. Also, we wanna make sure when someone does get connected to a mental health professional. So we've had it, we've recognized the signs, we've had the conversation, we wanna connect them to a mental health professional. But one thing to be aware of is that not all mental health professionals are equally trained in, in not just assessment of suicide, but ongoing care of suicide. So there are four treatment modalities that have been shown to be effective against or dealing with thoughts of suicide and suicide ideation. Uh, just a few are listed there. Um, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for suicide prevention, 
CAMS, which is Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicide Risk. So you want to make sure that you're getting that individual connected to a mental health professional with that specific training. And how do we deal with this on an ongoing basis, not whether or not this person should go to the hospital, which then leads to the last point. Many of our systems that we've created to respond to suicide crisis or mental health crisis are the same types of systems that we utilize for other types of crisis, law enforcement, first responders, fire departments. And what we've seen from the data, the research from the lived experience stories is that responding to suicide risk in the least restrictive setting is actually the most effective. So what level of care, how can we triage most effectively and meet this person where we're at? And this all started where we have a spectrum. A lot of times we think that we lump everyone who is having thoughts of suicide into one bucket. And in reality, someone who occasionally or casually has thoughts of suicide every once in a while, and someone who has overwhelming thoughts of suicide every minute of the day, we lump them all into the same bucket and call them these are suicidal individuals, these are at-risk individuals. But obviously one intervention on one end of the spectrum is not gonna be the same that's needed at the other end of the spectrum. And so we really need to look at our systems and what do we have, whether it's crisis lines, mobile crisis teams, stabilization units. And uh, here in California, which is where I'm based, uh, we were actually really fortunate. We had legislation passed that requires all schools that serve pupils in grades kindergarten through 12th grade to implement suicide prevention policies. And each of these, including staff training, but how are we responding to those youth once they've been identified as a key part of that? So I'm gonna break these down a little bit, uh, very quickly, just bit by bit. So again, uh, Access to trainings may be limited. There are trainings that are available virtually. I know uh, Question Persuade Refer QPR is being, um, is allowed to be done virtually right now, but also just spending some time on a website. Uh, this is a website that, I, that we created out in California. It's called the Know the Signs Campaign, where you can learn more about the warning signs. You can see that uh, it's available in English and Spanish, and also you can look at warning signs as they're unique to, to age groups. So we have you know, teenage warning signs, you know, general adult, older adult. And then also on the website in the find the word section, it's kind of a mini suicide prevention 101. So it'll teach you how to have that conversation or what questions to ask to make you feel more comfortable. Now, that's just the first step. Again, ideally you go on to get trained. I think in-person trainings or a virtual training will really make you not just educated, but feel more comfortable to have that conversation. I wanted to share that resource with you. On the next slide, I want to spend a moment and give you a, a crash course in suicide prevention, basically. Again, the, hard, the more we care about somebody, the, the closer we are to somebody, not only is it sometimes harder to see the warning signs, but it can be even more difficult to have the question. The more you have invested in that person, it can be a harder task, especially a parent asking a child. But oftentimes parents will ask me, well, when is the best time to talk to my kid about suicide? And I always tell them the best time to talk to a child or anyone about suicide is when you're not at all worried that they're having thoughts of suicide. And set the table and create that space so that when you do have a conversation about suicide later that is more serious or when they are in distress and they are having thoughts of suicide, there's that comfort around the topic. But of course, if you're worried about somebody, if anything in your gut, your instincts, you know, you can go and learn the warning signs all day long, but it really comes down back to trusting your gut. And if you think you need to ask about suicide, then you need to have a conversation about suicide. And so just a few quick questions on here. One is asking directly. We're not asking, are you thinking of harming yourself? Are you thinking of hurting yourself? You need to ask directly, are you thinking about suicide? To simplify it, I guess, two of the key factors that are involved in suicide are pain and hope. And suicides often happen when pain outweighs hope. And so in that moment, we need to, to understand what the person's pain is and if they're if you ask the question are you thinking about hurting yourself someone who's having thoughts of suicide might not see an attempt as hurting themselves they may actually see it as a release of their pain and so we need to ask directly are you thinking about suicide or are you thinking about killing yourself next we want to find out how far down that path are they and so we want to find out do you have a plan or have you thought about how you would attempt suicide again a very scary question but we wanna see, I'm gonna be a lot more concerned about someone who says, you know what, I have the, the means and the methods that are there at home as soon as I get there versus somebody who says, you know what, I haven't really thought about how I would do that. And that whether or not somebody has developed a plan is really what differentiates somebody from low risk into high risk. Now, once that's taken care of, once we know whether somebody's having thoughts of suicide, whether or not they have a plan, we know whether or not we're gonna be connecting them to, to further help to get assessed and, and more mental health care. 
But at that point, that's really all that we as friends and family need to know about suicide. What we need to do from that point on is understand the pain that is driving those thoughts of suicide. And so this third question represents actually about 20 questions, but let's do this. Let's pretend I'm your nephew and I come up to you and I say, auntie, uncle, I got a tummy ache. What kind of questions would you ask me about the pain in my stomach? You'd ask me how long I've been experiencing the pain. Scale of one to 10, how bad does it hurt? What causes the pain? When is the pain worse? What makes it better? Is there anything you can do to reduce the pain? And what we're doing if we translate that into suicide is now we're identifying with the source of the thoughts of suicide, which is the pain. So imagine a friend or family member comes to you and tells you that they, and you ask them if they're having thoughts of suicide. And you say, well, how long have you been experiencing this pain? When is it the worst? Has it ever been at a 10? Okay, was it a 10 a couple of days ago? Where is it at now? Is it a five? Well, what happened in the last couple of days to bring it down from a 10 to a five? And it, again, it's going to build more trust. It's going to build rapport. But also we're speaking to the person about these issues. So again, that's a very short version of it. And if we had more time, we'd get into breakout groups and have you actually practice this. And I know this is a weird request, but if you're capable um, tonight in the, in the mirror or when you're driving in the car or alone in your bedroom, just say these questions out loud. Because as difficult as it's going to be to say these questions in practice, and I don't say this to scare you, it's going to be a thousand times more uncomfortable when you have to do it for real. And that's okay. That doesn't mean that we don't have a job to do and that we don't ask the question. We have to embrace and acknowledge our own feelings and fear and have that conversation. All right. So on the next slide, I wanted to share with you one of the things you can do with an individual after you've had a conversation about suicide. Of course, contacting the Access and Crisis Line or the National Lifeline, which we'll get to in a second. But I, I shared this idea of a safety plan. And so a safety plan, the way that I describe it, and I'm sorry if this is a California analogy for everybody, but it's teaching somebody how to swim against a rip current rather than hoping that somebody is there to throw them a life preserver. So it is helping that individual to identify what are my own warning signs? How do I react when I'm going into that place? What are some of my coping strategies? Can I journal, write, exercise? What, what's something within my capability that can help me cope? From there, what are some of my distractions? What, I, what can I do to break the own record in my head to get my mind off of suicide? Even for just a moment, that little bit of reprieve, even if it's video games or going for a walk, whatever it is, or other people I can connect with. And then who is my crisis network? Who can I let into the circle to trust with the, that I'm having these thoughts? And then of course, as part of that is mean safety, which we'll talk about here in just a moment as well. Uh, so that's the safety plan. What you see on the screen is actually something called the My3 app. You can go to my3app.org. It's available for free on iPhone and Android. Uh, my team created it, but then we shared it. The National Lifeline now has it, and it's, it's a tool. Again, ideally you want to be doing this with a mental health professional, but given the circumstances, uh, if you don't have that access or access right away, uh, you're perfectly capable to sit down with somebody and start creating a safety plan. And on the next slide, just want to speak briefly. Um, as part of a safety plan, or once someone has been identified that they're having thoughts of suicide, we want to make sure that we're keeping them safe from, from means and methods. So what we call means safety in suicide prevention. And a few ways to do that. How do we keep that person in a safer environment? Or how do we, one of the questions that I just took you through, well, do you have a plan and what is that plan? When we identify what plan or what means or methods that individual might use, now we can better limit their access to those things. And a lot of people will say, well, what's the point of taking away this? They're just going to use that. And if you take away that, they're going to go back to this. And in reality, when uh, looking at the data around suicide and lived experience from suicide attempt survivors, is substitution is very rare. Uh, people are often tied to one mean or one method. And if there is substitution, that substituted means is more, most likely going to be much less lethal than the means that they, that they had intended on. So having a conversation and looking around, uh, the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, as well as the Education Fund to Stop Gun Violence, has some really good information on how to, to make an, an environment more safe. But again, it all starts with first having that conversation about it. On the next slide, I just wanted to share with you some of the resources. So you might ask, well, okay, I've had the conversation. I've asked them. They've told me they're having thoughts of suicide. What do I do now? And the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, a lot of people or any crisis resource really, a lot of people think that there is a level of distress or crisis that you need to pass before you can contact one of these, like 911. I, it's not an emergency, so I can't contact them. In reality, that's, that's not true with the crisis resources. They wanna talk to you before there's distress, before there's crisis. So if you've had a bad day, 
if this webinar raises some emotions for you and you need to talk to somebody, if you're preparing to have a conversation with your child or loved one about suicide and you need to get coached up, or you just had that conversation and now you're not sure where to go or you know, you're scared and, and kind of, you know, where do I go? You can contact the crisis line and you'll speak to a trained counselor who can help you triage and navigate where do I go. So don't hesitate. They're always happy to hear from you. Um, there's crisis centers all across the country that are all routed through the National Lifeline. So by calling 1-800-273-8255, you'll be routed back to your local crisis center. And then the crisis text line is another incredible resource. It's a separate organization, but it's a way to communicate via text. So uh, the Lifeline also has an online chat. There are a wealth of resources, the Trevor chat line, uh, Trans Lifeline also has a, an online chat. There's a number of resources out there, uh, COP line as well. Uh, so please don't hesitate to reach out. And so I think that was my uh, suicide prevention in hopefully five minutes or less. I'm, I'm sorry, I tried to co cover a lot, um, but hopefully we'll have more opportunities to go more in depth. So I'll turn it back to, new, to you, Nalini. Great, thank you so much, Dan. Um, as we're wrapping up here, I noticed that folks um, did have some difficulty at the beginning. So I wanna reiterate a couple of things that um, we talked about at the beginning as the importance of having this conversation. Um, so why suicide prevention matters so much to Sandy Hook Promise, there are four main things um, that we've highlighted throughout this conversation. First is that suicide prevention is gun violence prevention. If you came to us knowing um, about our work in gun violence prevention, um, it's important to know that two thirds of gun violence is suicide. And that's why we care so deeply about this issue and why it's something we want to share with you and have this conversation. Second, as you've learned from this conversation as well, um, it's a part of our program work. When we are going into schools and training students and teachers, suicide prevention is a core element of what we do and is a core element of our approach to violence prevention as a whole. It's also something that is notably changing in, in the current situation with this pandemic, with COVID-19. We know that there are new factors or changing factors when it comes to risks when it comes to mental health and suicide prevention is one of those things that we want to pay attention to. I do want to underscore here that we're not quite at the place to cre uh, create direct ties between the pandemic and suicide. It's happening. We're in it right now. What we can do best is be prepared for what's going to come down the line and make sure that we're in a good place to be able to tackle it head on. And lastly, um, this is the message we do want to leave you with is that it works. Suicide prevention is based in research. Um, suicide prevention experts and specialists are based in research. We know that these methods do work when they're implemented um, and that we can save lives. And that underscores all the work we do as well. So um, with that, I want to um, give you a couple next steps on how you can continue to stay involved with our work. Um, first, our social media channels are a great way to stay in touch with us um, on the regular, whether it's big events or small daily events, we're um, consistently online and updating folks as to all the issues where um, we are involved with. You'll see on the screen here um, all of our channels and where you can follow us. If you're interested in getting more involved, if, you're, if this has motivated you to learn more about Sandy Hook Promise, to take action, whether um, it's virtual or eventually in person, I encourage you all to visit our website and sign up as a Promise Leader. Um, Promise Leaders are um, our volunteers who take elevated actions to help advocate for and support gun violence prevention in schools um, and across the country. We have a large network across the country of these engaged individuals, and we hope you join us as they um, continue to be a part of our important work. I'm gonna hand it over to Stan for a little bit on how you can stay involved with directing changes work as well. So one of the programs um, that I represent that I, I'm really proud I co-founded, it's called the Directing Change Program and Film Contest. Now currently, uh, it's a California program. We piloted uh, piloted the program nationally this spring. So um, as soon as we launch the national version, hopefully in the fall, um, hopefully Nalini, you can help me get some information out. But in the meantime, the website is directingchangeca.org. And what it is, it's a mental health and suicide prevention program for youth, but it's built around a film contest. So all the things we want youth to learn about mental health and suicide prevention happens through the organic process of film creation. So it's an evaluated program. One of the things we've gotten high marks on is how long after their participation youth retain the information uh, because when we create something that's when it really sticks with us and so that's one of the, the key components of it. 
On the back end, though, we also provide a variety of supports. So uh, you see in the bottom left, we have on our website under the four schools section, there's some resources for parents. There's a brochure on suicide prevention specifically for parents. There's also a toolkit to replicate an activity that was started in my hometown of Poway, California, called What I Wish My Parents Knew. And it's a, it's a forum and academy to engage parents on mental health related topics. So the toolkit helps guide you through all that. And also, we are in our ninth year of the program, and on the bottom right, uh, you'll see a screenshot of what it looks like. Um, up here at the top, it says watch and use films. So when you go to our website, you have access to nine years worth of films. Over, th you know, I think over 3,000 films are posted on the website. Uh, this year, we just received 1,200 submissions, uh, so we'll be posting some of the best of there as well. Uh, they're free to download, free to use, so if you're either sparking a conversation with somebody uh, when the world returns to normal, giving a training or a presentation or trying to, to start some community momentum, uh, please feel free to hop on and download some of the films. And uh, do, we have, do we have the time, Malini, to I'm, – I'm not sure how many slides we have left. I think we just – I'll leave it to you. Do we have the time to do it? Yeah, I think we do. Um, so Stan has a short video okay. for us um, that we are going to play. Okay. And while she's pulling that up, I'd also mention that we have a lot of resources on the website for school uh, school based intervention as well. Well, thank you, Nalini, for uh, allowing us the time to do that. I really appreciate it. So that's just one of our films. Again, that was a youth-created film. Um, so there's many, many more on the website. So please stop by directingchange.org and check it out. Okay, thank you, Stan. And then with the last couple of minutes, um, I do want to pass the mic back to Mark and Nicole. I think some folks may not have heard or had audio issues at the beginning, just for a couple of closing words. I just want to say thank you, all of you. You did a wonderful job at this webinar. Um, this is a, a great and uh, useful and valuable tool. Um, and we uh, we appreciate all the folks who joined. Um, it looks like, if, if I'm reading this right, we had uh, well over 300 folks in attendance. And uh, we appreciate your engagement. We hope you found this valuable uh, and know that we are continuing to evaluate and monitor and respond to this changing situation so that we can continue to meet the needs uh, of, of the students, the communities, the schools and the families uh, who need our work now maybe more than ever so thank you for that and uh, we appreciate the, the all of you being here with us and, and i suppose the only thing that i would add is um thanks and thank you nalini alex and stan uh, for pulling this together and uh, i hope that those of you that are able to watch today or watch afterwards that you join us for our other webinars on safe storage and youth wellness as well and that if you have ideas of topics that you would like us to be talking to, please let us know that as well, because uh, we're here to serve you. Thank you. Thank you both. So um, we encourage you to reach out to us. Um, I'll echo what Mark and Nicole said. Um, we want to be able to serve you, and we want to be able to engage with you on the topics that matter most to you. We really appreciate your time with us here today. Um, we have two more webinars coming up um, next Wednesday and the following Wednesday at 12 p.m. also. Both of those topics will be covering important issues tied to um, the pandemic and tied to our work at large. And we hope you join us for that. Um, many people have asked um, that if this will be recorded, the answer is yes. Um, we will be distributing that. 
um, you'll have the opportunity to share that out with folks um, and we'll be providing some additional resources. We'll be asking for your feedback as well um, to help continue to make these better going forward in the future. Um, again, really appreciate your time. We know time is very precious right now and we know that folks are dealing with a lot. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be with us, um, to be with each other and to learn the information that we have here. Um, and we hope that you feel um, that you've gotten resources on suicide prevention, um, more tools and more knowledge to um, help you feel empowered as you move through this. Um, our email address um, for folks who are interested in reaching out to us is advocacy at sandyhookpromise.org. We'll be um, filtering through the questions that folks have asked during the duration of this webinar. We'll be responding to folks there. Don't hesitate to reach out, we're here for you. Um, and thank you so much. We will wrap up now. Um, thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your day.